Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 in AP English and our World of Ideas lectures. We are now in lecture number 32. This is unit number 6, Culture, and we are with Herodotus, the observations on Egypt from his classic history. Our translator here, by the way, is David Green. We will um, be working from several major assumptions. The first is that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net in the AP folder, the World of Ideas folder, lectures 1 through 31, because I'm going to be making references to some of those lectures, and so I'm hoping that you're following us. Also, I'm assuming that you are familiar with our learning theory, the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. When we study culture, this is hypercritical that we would think in these terms, and of course we do that in our reading through what we call active reading or annotation by answering three guiding questions. Level 1, what does the text say? There we will always perform some kind of paragraph outlining lecture uh, uh, level two. What, um, what does the text mean? And then finally level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? At 2A, we will ask, um, what does this text mean in relationship to our big five? What does this text say about epistemology, what we can know, ontology, who we are, psychology, the study of the individual mind, sociology, the study of group, collective minds, and then finally theodicy, the question of evil, pain, suffering in the world, and then finally themes, messages at 2A. We'll ask it to be rhetoric, not what Herodotus says, but how he says it. And then at 3A we'll ask, how can I relate this to other titles that I'm familiar with, and then finally to myself. And then the final assumption again is, I hope that you guys are reading this material on your own and then using me as a, as a, as a helper, right? Now let's turn to Herodotus as a brief biography here. Um, we think roughly around 484 birth and then somewhere between 430 and 420 uh, death BCE. He is in many ways the first true Greek historian along with Thrasydides. He's the other great Greek historian. His history, the history of the Persian and Greek wars from 499 to, 5, to 479 BCE um, is, is a, a huge part of, of the project of his life. He did have a multicultural upbringing, which helped him to maintain a certain level of objectivity. He was a great traveler, Egypt, Libya, as well as Babylon, uh, Byzantium, and then maybe even further, further out than that. Um, just to turn to what Jacobus has to say about the reading that we'll be doing observations uh, from Egypt on 477 and 478. Jacobus says, the sections that appear here are from the second, part two, lines 45 to 92 of the five books that comprise the history of Herodotus and focus on Egyptian culture. Um, in its time, Greek uh, culture was very interested in Egyptian culture as the foreign, as different, and the like, and so obviously they wanted to know about this, what was going on there. Um, Herodotus covers a wide variety of subjects, beginning with sacrifices and animals in an attempt to refute the rumor that Egyptians intended to sacrifice the Greek hero um, Heracles, who was said to have instead turned on his hosts and slaughtered them all. Herodotus laughs at such a story on several grounds. He first claims that the Egyptians do not sacrifice animals. He contradicts himself later, by the way. And then he argues that it's ridiculous to suppose a single man could slaughter thousands. Besides, uh, I'm sorry, because he's a skeptic and defends a rational view of things, he is a remarkable observer of culture. He balances, uh, Jacobus says, the stories he's heard with the likelihood of their being true. Herodotus will display, Jacobus goes on to point out, great curiosity about the culture of the Egyptians. He talks about animals, especially sacred animals, and, and the devotion of those sacred animals. Um, and then he will finally talk about funeral rites, embalming practices, and the like. Now, let's just point out, Herodotus is going to say some of the most controversial stuff that you will read in 303 in this essay about those Egyptians. Now, whether it's true or not, it certainly is going to be controversial because in both cases we're going to have issues of sexuality. But you'll notice that, and now we're to the rhetoric, to the rhetoric side, you'll notice that um, his tone is very objective in this, and, and very rarely does he step in and make certain kinds of negative comments about the cultural differences between the Greeks and the Egyptians. Um, he will mess around with great uh, digressions in this reading. You're going to see that. He has tremendous narrative skill. He loves to tell stories. I'm just with you on 479. Jacobus will point out that Herodotus does not construct complex metaphors as he tells his story. He moves directly to the things that interest him. He gives us the important facts in an efficient manner. When he has an anecdote to tell, he does so. When something shocking happens, as in the case, for example, in paragraph 2 of the woman that we're told who copulates with a goat in the Medizan province, 
He gives us the facts as he knows them, and he lets us draw our own conclusion. When he disapproves of a specific practice, he lets us know by his tone or by telling descriptive terms such as monstrosity or something like that. We'll, we'll, we'll see this a little bit later in the reading. Finally, uh, Jacobus points out, that Herodotus's clear informative style, coupled with his astute analysis of cultural practices, established him as one of history's first historians and also one of the greatest. His eye for details that both linked the Egyptians to and differentiated them from the Greeks made his work relevant and engrossing to the readers of his day as well as, of course, to ours. No question. My hope is that you'll be interested in going on to read more of Herodotus uh, as, we, as we get on into the, the study here. All right, let's go through it. We have um, 48 paragraphs, so we'll be combining a few of these. Let's go to work. Paragraph 1. A Greek story, he says, about the Egyptians' treatment of Heracles shows how little the Greeks understand Egyptian customs. Paragraph 2. Egyptians do not sacrifice goats. They regard these animals as holy, associating them with the god Pan. And then, of course, we have in paragraph number 2 that really infamous story about a woman and a goat. Paragraph 3. Egyptians regard the pig as unclean, fit for sacrifice only in festivals honoring the moon and Dionysus. Paragraphs 4 5. Egyptians celebrate the festival of Dionysus, much as the Greeks do. Malephus, who introduced Dionysian ritual in Greece, learned it, I believe he says, from Egypt. So in other words, it will be to Herodotus that he will deliver some ideas to the Greeks about how some traditions that the Greeks believed their own and of their own creating were actually borrowed from earlier traditions. Paragraph 6, 7. Likewise, he says, I believe that the names of most Greek gods originate in Egypt. But it was from the Palatians, as, uh, not the Egyptians, that the Greeks adopted the practice of making statues of Hermes uh, with a, a, an erect penis. Paragraphs 8 through 9. According to priestesses at Dodona, uh, the names of the Greek gods came indirectly from Egypt by way of the Pelagians. It is my belief, however, he says, that the poets Homer and Hesod created for the Greeks their theogony, that is to say, the uh, stories of their gods. Paragraphs 10 through 13. Explanations vary regarding the origin of oracles, this idea of predictions and knowing the future and getting advice. Egyptians claim that priestesses taken from Thebes in Egypt became the first oracles. Some Greeks claim that oracles originated from the pronouncements of two black doves that flew from Thebes. He says, I believe, however, the first oracle was an Egyptian woman sold into slavery who, after learning Greek, founded a place of prophecy in Greece. This woman was called Dove because her Egyptian speech sounded to the Greeks like the talk of birds. Paragraph 14, in any event, it's clear that methods of prophecy and many religious practices of the Greeks originated in Egypt. Now this idea, just pause for a moment, I mean this could be controversial, we can already talk at 3a. For example, when we study the Epic of Gilgamesh, there is of course the story of the Great Flood. And many biblical scholars, when they discovered this, were like, hurrah, we have corroborating evidence. The only problem is that the Epic of Gilgamesh predates anything biblical by a number of years. And that obviously led a whole number of people to say, wait a minute, are some of the stories in the religious sacred texts, in fact, borrowings from supposedly pagan cultures, you see? And to that degree, we're already opening up the door for cross-cultural, comparative religious studies, historical studies. It's going to be very controversial in the 20th century. Herodotus is, in many ways, one of the first people to to kind of start this game going, right? Paragraphs 15 through 19. Egyptians hold six, we're told, religious assemblies annually at various cities, each honoring a particular god. They travel um, noisily, for example, to Babustis uh, to honor Artemis, and once there they celebrate with sacrifice wine drinking. Isis is honored at Burisus, which, uh, with much lamentation following the festival, at Seus, where Athena is honored, the people burn lamps through the night. The god Helios is honored at Heliopolis, uh, and the god Leto at Butum. At Paparmis, the celebration of Ares includes groups of uh, priests battling each other in a violent ritual. In other words, there is some interesting ceremonies associated with religious practices that are, are um, for the uh, Greeks, maybe a little bit different. Although they obviously have their own as well. Egyptians, uh, paragraph 20, Egyptians were the first people to feel religious scruples, especially regarding sexuality. Paragraph 21, Egyptians consider animals sacrificed, uh, I'm sorry, Egyptians consider animals sacred and appoint keepers to protect them. And in some cases, killing an animal is a capital offense. Obviously, sacrifice does come to mind. Paragraphs 22 through 23. This is about cats for the cat lovers in the house. Egyptians hold cats in especially high esteem, mummifying dead ones. Though it is protected, the cat population is reduced by the animals' self-destructive behaviors and by male cats killing of kittens in order to entice
female cats to mate. Let's talk about other animals. Paragraphs 24 through 26, the crocodile. The crocodile lives on land and water and manifests a number of unusual physical features, behaviors. Some Egyptians regard the crocodile as sacred, treat with great respect, others denying its sacredness, hunted for food. Paragraphs 27 through 30, Egyptians regard various other animals as sacred, the hippopotamus, the otters, some serpents, and then the, mention, the famous mention in Herodotus, of the phoenix, a rare sacred bird that according to the people performs extraordinary feats, though he says, I myself doubt the claims made about this bird, right? Paragraphs 31 through 32, near the city of Muto, he says, I saw countless skeletons of winged serpents from Arabia that had been killed by ibis birds. For keeping these serpents out of Egypt, the ibis, a wonderfully black crane-like bird, is much honored. Of course, you probably remember the text Scarlet I this reading uh, in your freshman year. You can go back and take a look at that uh, in the LearnStrong.net uh, folder for freshmen. Paragraphs 33 through 34. Egyptians, he says, enjoy excellent health because of their climate. Now, much is going to be made about this by Montesquieu later, the notion that we are our climate. They believe that food, while nourishing, is also a source of disease, and so they use um, emetics and purges regularly. Their diet includes bread, wine, fish, fowl, and other meats. In their custom at the end of a banquet to be reminded, uh, I'm sorry, it is their custom at the end of the banquet to be reminded of their mortality. Paragraphs 35 uh, through 36. Other customs include singing of their only chant, a song identical to one sung by the Greeks. Some Egyptian customs for greeting people are also similar to Greek customs. By the way, this is, of course, what we call culture, culture contact and anthropological study. When uh, you meet a new culture for the first time, and Herodotus is just kind of walking you through some of the things. Like if I dropped you down in Southgate Market in South Korea, Seoul, South Korea, um, you, would, you, you would be stunned by some of the things that you would be exposed to. You would see it as foreign. It would be initially initial first contact, right? He's kind of describing some of that. Paragraph 37, he says, Egyptians wear linen and wool, but the religion forbids the use of wool in temples or as a burial garment. Paragraph 38 through 39, Egyptians associate each month and day with a particular god and believe that the day of, the, of a man's birth influences his future. Of course, the Greeks to some degree also shared some of these ideas about astrology and the like. They also believe that events follow recurrent patterns and they use various means of divination. Paragraph 40, Egyptian doctors specialize uh, uh, strictly by disease. So this is now about the medical practices. Paragraphs 41 through 44, this is some of the most controversial parts of Herodotus. Egyptians mourn in the streets after the death of a well-known member of their household. The corpse is then prepared by embalmers. Of course, Egyptians are famous for this embalming, right? Three forms of embalming are available. The most perfect form requires extensive preparation of the body, followed by wrapping and closure in a body-shaped coffin. The middle and low forms require less elaborate preparation of the corpse. Paragraphs 45, 46, very uh, kind of disturbing stuff. And yet notice Herodotus will just report it. Families, he says, retain the bodies of great or beautiful women for several days after death to prevent the embalmers from doing any kind of uh, sexual activity with them. Yuck, right? The bodies of those who die in the river are regarded as more than human and thus buried with special care. Finally, to finish, paragraphs 47 48. Egyptians generally avoid following Greek customs, but in one city, Shamus, the people claim Egyptian ancestry for Perseus and honor him in a Greek manner. And finally, paragraph 48. Egyptians who live in the marshes have customs much the same as those who do not. However, the marsh dwellers use water lilies and papyrus as a food source. Well, that's the reading of our cutting from Herodotus. Let's now go to levels two and three. Well, epistemologically, what's going on here? Well, I mean, what can one know? I think it's pretty clear. Herodotus is not necessarily arguing for a relativist position. That is to say, um, all cultures are, relatively speaking, you know, only specific to their own place and time. And therefore, all cultures, because he does make, he does pass judgment on several activities that the Egyptians do that he considers to be immoral or unethical or, or inappropriate. But he's certainly not arguing for some kind of cultural xenophobia as well. Um, you'll remember it from our study in AP. Xenia means proper hospitality. So xenophobia is seeing the, uh, the, the other as foreign and therefore necessarily that being afraid of it. Uh, we would argue epistemologically that Herodotus bears for the most part a fallibilist position. And he is suggesting to his Greek audience and readers they also should epistemologically have a fallibilist position. In other words, 
you know, you should hear it out and decide for yourself. And, and then about your positions, decide whether you're going to accept these cultural practices as acceptable or taboo. Ontologically, Herodotus says, well, we are naturally given to worship, to reverence, and we do it in different ways. Psychologically, he always comments on the power of fear as a powerful motivator, especially in the notion of worship and the like, and, and of course notions of afterlife and how you're supposed to bury. Sociologically, um, really, really, I think the point here is, is a sociological rendering, which is why this text is, of course, put in our culture section. That is to say, our customs do differ radically from culture to culture, no question. Finally, theodicy, well, I think Herodotus points out several times in the, in the broader text especially that pain and suffering does happen when we refuse to, re to respect others, others' ways. And, of course, when we don't respect our traditions. Herodotus is very much about that as well. At 2 a major message is themes here. We should try to understand other cultures as a clear message. Don't assume necessarily your culture is right and others are wrong. That is to say, respecting other cultures is important. And finally, history and culture is full of surprises. This is one of those important gifts Herodotus gives to us. You're shocked when you read some of what he has to say. And again, some of the sexual stuff is a bit shocking in its, in its honesty. And yet notice that he just kind of treats it, if he feels like it's uh, something you know, inappropriate, he will use certain kinds of, of declarations. But he doesn't go into completely defaming the Egyptians because of some of the things the embalmers might do or something like that. At 2B, the style is very simple, the narrative is powerful, the storytelling. He does treat controversial subjects, and, and he tries to do it as objectively as possible, as we've said. At 3A and other titles that come to mind, well, I've mentioned Thrasydides, obviously an important historian. Plutarch's Lives, I've given a lecture, a series of comments on that in the Harvard Classics at LearnStrong.net. These are other historians. I'll just mention Daniel Bornstein's The Discoverers. Write that one down. It's a wonderful title. It remains a compelling read. Daniel Bornstein, the head, the library of the Library of Congress for many years, writes history as novel. It's compelling reading. I very much recommend it. And I recommend of the list of suggested texts at the end of that reading, which is quite remarkable as well. Finally, at 3B, what was the time that you were engaged in culture contact and you enjoyed it? What was the time when you did not? How about this one? Why do you think it's important to learn to respect others' cultures instead of just outright declaring them wrong or inappropriate? And what is it for you that makes the study of history either enjoyable or not enjoyable? As we uh, finish our study of Herodotus, maybe you'll be interested to go on and study other cultures. Is there a culture that you don't know about? This is a fun 3B question. Is there a culture you don't know about that you would like to learn more about? And then maybe you'll begin to do some reading and study on your own. Well, there you go. That's the Herodotus reading, and, I, and again, I hope that you'll uh, I hope that you'll be challenged in this reading uh, to to get on then with with more of Herodotus. Let's go next to uh, Devaka and a, a, a truly amazing story this man has to tell. Thank you.